Hello everyone, Puso here. I recently completed my first Pokemon Nuzlocke. I chose to do it in Fire Red because it's the game that I'm the most familiar with due to the countless times I've played through it both in challenges and casual runs. I looked into Nuzlocke's for a while before attempting one myself. I looked at all the required rules as well as many optional rules. I'm writing the script of this video as I go with one exception that I'll get to in a bit. Now let's get into the rules of the run. For those of you who don't know, a Nuzlocke is a type of Pokemon challenge where instead of fainting, your Pokemon die. If a Pokemon goes down in battle, you either have to box it permanently or release it. Most people don't start with this rule until they get their Pokeballs, but I'm going to be using it immediately. In addition to that, you can only catch the first Pokemon you encounter in a location. If you knock it out or run out of balls, that Pokemon's gone, and you can't try for another one. This particular rule does not activate until you get your Pokeballs. Another rule is that you have to nickname your Pokemon in an attempt to get more attached to them. If your entire party dies, you lose the run, even if you have other usable Pokemon in the PC. In addition to these rules, I used a few optional rules. One of these rules is the Duplicates Clause. This rule allows me to pass on any Pokemon that I've already caught without losing my encounter on a route. I also allowed myself to catch Pokemon after my route encounter, but I'm not allowed to use them. I allowed this because in Fire Red, in order to obtain the item finder and the experience share, you need to have Pokemon registered in your Pokedex. You need the item finder in order to get the leftovers. These Pokemon I catch are specifically for the Pokedex and get immediately placed in the PC. I'm also not using legendary Pokemon in this run. Another set of optional rules that I used was to have the battle style on set, so I can't freely switch between Pokemon after I knock out one of my opponents. I can't use items in battle in this run either. I also ran the ROM through the Universal Pokemon Randomizer. It was mostly for quality of life changes, like lowercase Pokemon names and the ability to use running shoes indoors, but I did enable trade evolutions by level up. One further thing is that I'm not researching anything apart from the learn sets of my Pokemon. I can't look into my opponent's Pokemon or their move sets. I'm not looking at the possible route spawns either. When I say that certain Pokemon can appear on a route, I'm basing it completely off of memory. A note I'm making now is that I didn't have the idea to put this on YouTube until I was already partway through the run. I recreated that part of the run after the fact, so you might see different genders of Pokemon or different levels. I ran through the part I already did quicker due to not using the rules of the overall run. In the actual run, I overleveled in order to keep my Pokemon alive. In the recreation, I didn't have to care, because it was only for the sake of the recording. For that part of the recording, I'm doing the best I can based on memory and the summary information of my Pokemon in order to create the script. So without further ado, let's get into the run. I started off by choosing Charmander as my starter. I chose Charmander because Charizard has a more versatile learn set than either Venusaur or Blastoise. I name him Kilgara. That's the name of the dragon from the Merlin TV show. I proceeded to battle Gary for the first time. I growled his Squirtle once and then scratched it down. From there, I did the usual fetch quest and obtained my Pokeballs from Professor Oak. It was time to start catching some Pokemon. On Route 1, I caught a Rattata and called it Splinter. My next stop is Route 2, where I catch a Pidgey. I pulled a page out of MDB's playbook and called it Swallow, because that's hilarious to me. I'm using both of these captures to my advantage, but more on that later. The only spawns on Routes 1 and 2 are Pidgeys and Rattatas, so I'm guaranteed to catch them both due to the Duplicates Clause. After catching Swellow, I moved to Route 22. This is the route just west of Viridian that leads to Victory Road. Mankey, Spiro, and Rattata can spawn here. This is where catching Splinter comes into play. Now there are only two possible options that I'd be required to catch. What I want is a Mankey, and that's just what I got. I named her Prima Donna because the idea of a mouthless pig monkey being the lead female vocalist in an opera is hilarious. I trained all of my current Pokemon up to level 10 and took on the optional Gary fight. He has a Pidgey now, but he still went down without much of an issue. 
It's on to Viridian Forest. I'm not sure what Pokemon I want from here. My first encounter was a Pikachu. I'm not sure whether this was good or bad luck. Raichu is my favorite Gen 1 electric Pokemon, but I'm not blind to how fragile it is. I named my Pikachu MDB because at the time I played this, he used Pikachu the most frequently in his challenges. Before battling Brock in Pewter City, I got my whole team up to level 15 in the forest. It's an annoying grind, but I'd rather do it that way than to lose a Pokemon to the gym. Brock wasn't much trouble though due to having Prima Donna on my team. I karate chopped his Jidu down and one low kick took care of Onix. I grabbed the running shoes and proceeded to Route 3. I was hoping to catch a male Nidoran because I wanted to have a Nidoking on my team. That's not what happened though. My encounter was a Spearow. Yeah. I don't know what to say about that. I don't foresee Fearow being anywhere near as useful as a Nidoking. I named the Spearow Disappoint, because Disappointment wouldn't fit. Route 4 is an interesting one. There isn't any grass on it until after you get through Mount Moon. This allowed me to buy the Magikarp from the man in the Pokemon Center. That Magikarp counts as my encounter for Route 4. I name it Sodorig. Not very creative, I know, but that's what my brothers and my older sister always called the Red Gyarados in the Gen 2 games that we grew up playing. Inside Mount Moon, I got my next encounter. I found a G-Dude, and I couldn't have been happier. In Fire Red, you can't get a Crobat until you get the National Dex, and that doesn't happen until after the Elite Four. This makes G-Dude the best possible option to catch. I really like the G-Dude line, and having a ground type is great for Surge. Rock doesn't resist as much as Steel, but it's still very good in the early game. I named my G-Dude Dwayne. I'd sincerely hope I don't have to explain that one. I picked up the Dome Fossil because I like Kabutops more than Omastar, but that ends up not mattering in the long run. I felt the need to bring it up though for some reason. Maybe it's because comments are good for the YouTube algorithm. Outside of Mount Moon, I started training up my whole team to level 20 before proceeding. I made a mistake though. I remembered that there was a bug trainer on Nugget Bridge, so I thought I'd go there for some easy experience for Soda Rig, since she was level 15 and had Tackle now. But I forgot about the Gary fight there. I didn't lose any Pokemon, but I came pretty close, and that was a wake-up call for me. I went right back to the grass to train my Pokemon. From that point forward, I stopped rushing ahead in an attempt to level up faster. I moved to Route 24, hoping to catch an Oddish. Instead, I got a Caterpie. Great. I named it Toasty in a lame attempt to make some sort of buttered toast joke, but seeing as Butterfree won't really be useful going forward, I just boxed it. I tried again for an Oddish on Route 25, but I got a Weedle. Seriously? Seriously? <sighs> I call it Twin Peaks due to Beedrill Stingers and threw it in the box. I have a plan for this though. Remember how I said I had a use for catching a Pidgey? This comes into play here. Routes 5 and 6 have the exact same Pokemon spawns as each other. You can encounter Pidgey, Meowth, and Oddish on them. This allows me to guarantee myself an Oddish. So I get one even though I wanted one sooner. The only reason I wanted one sooner was to get it leveling up faster. On Route 5, I caught a Meowth, which I called Giovanni. On Route 6, I finally get my Oddish, and I name her Chloe, because the name sort of resembles Chlorophyll. You might be wondering why I want an Oddish so badly. There are a few reasons for that. Vileplume has a base special attack of 110, making it a solid choice for a grass type. Grass is my favorite type, and Vileplume is my favorite Gen 1 Grass Pokemon. Vileplume might not be the best choice, but since it's my favorite, that's what I'm using. On Route 11, I caught a Drowsy, which I named Inducer because I really couldn't think of anything better. I caught a Diglett in Diglett Cave. I know, shocking, right? I named it Dig Dug. After catching everything I was able to up until this point, I battled all the trainers I could. I boarded the SSN and battled all the trainers there. The rival battle wasn't very difficult due to all my Pokemon being at least level 25. 
After exiting the ship, it was finally time to take on Misty. However, with a level 30 Gyarados on my team, she wasn't much of a problem. I just used Secret Power and Bite in order to take her down. Surge was similarly easy due to having a high level Graveler with Magnitude. If you have a good ground type on your team, there really isn't much that Surge can do to you. I ran through Digla Cave in order to get the HM Flash. While I was there, I went up to the museum in Pewter to grab the Old Amber. I proceeded to Rock Tunnel now that Giovanni knows both Cut and Flash. Before I got there, I caught an Ekans on Route 9 and named it Bubbles. I'm not explaining that one. I'm curious as to how many of you can figure it out. I got to Route 10 and caught a Voltorb that I named Sparky. Inside the cave, there are two Pokemon that I can pass on for my encounter. Those two are Jadun and Mankey. That leaves me with three options for my encounter, only one of which I actually want. I can catch a Zubat, an Onix, or a Machop. I want the Machop, and I just happened to find one. I caught it, and Goro joined the team. I trained him up to the rest of the team's level in the entrance of the cave before I proceeded through. Outside the cave, I made my way towards Celadon. After going through the underground tunnel, I caught a Growlithe on Route 7. I named him Barkamedes, because I find it entertaining. The first thing I did in Celadon was to grab the coin case and buy an Abra from the game corner. I named him Zatara, and made my way to Saffron to grab the TM for Psychic. I headed back to Route 24, just north of Cerulean. I trained Zatara up to level 30 from level 9 against the Oddish and Abras on that route. Both Oddish and Abra give special attack effort values, so Zatara's damage output is going to be incredible. I went back to Celadon and grabbed a Thunderstone and a Leaf Stone from the department store. I evolved MDB and proceeded to the Rocket Hideout. Giovanni proved very easy to deal with since I had Goro on my team. At this stage of the game, all of Giovanni's Pokemon are weak to fighting. I really don't understand why he has a Kangaskhan, though, considering how he's supposed to be a ground trainer. Pokemon Tower was just as easy, considering how much higher my Pokemon's levels were, compared to Gary and the trainers there. This rival fight would be harder if you were actually required to complete it before moving on to the next town. The only reason for that, though, would be the lower levels of your Pokemon. While I was in Pokemon Tower, I caught a Cubone and named it Body Count because the first challenge I ever did in a Pokemon game was to play through Emerald with only a Cubone. Now that I have the Poke Flute, I decided to try catching a Snorlax. I start with the one west of Celadon, but it became apparent very quickly that my team wouldn't survive the catching attempt with the strategy I was using. I had already swapped out three of my Pokemon in order to prevent their deaths, so I cut my losses and I ran away. I went to the Snorlax location on Route 12 with a different strategy. Chloe hit the Snorlax with Acid. Snorlax used Rest and Avis Barry to wake up. That's exactly what I was hoping for. I hit the Snorlax with Sleep Powder and started chucking Great Balls. I caught it on my second throw, which was very lucky. Lardo went into the PC in case I needed him. That catches us up to where my run is now, so all the footage from here on out will be from the actual run. I have a few options for what I can do now. I can do the Erica fight, the Fighting Dojo, Sylph Co., or I can make my way to Fuchsia. I opt to make my way to Fuchsia so that I can battle all the trainers on the way. I need to get my team up to level 40 because I have an issue with it. That problem is Sotoreg. Now I'm sure some of you are thinking that I'm crazy. Gyarados is a very strong Pokemon, so why would I have a problem with it? The answer is that I'm playing in Gen 3. In Gens 2 and 3, Gyarados can't take advantage of its typing very well. Prior to Gen 4, all water moves are special moves. In Gen 1, Gyarados has a base special stat of 100, but Gen 2 split the special stat into special attack and special defense. Gyarados has a base special attack stat of 60. That's the same as a coughing. That's terrible. Gyarados is a physical attacking, water flying Pokemon. So, just use flying moves, right? Heh, <laughs> wrong. Gyarados can't learn any flying moves in Gens 2 and 3, so if I want to use Gyarados as well as possible, I don't get any stab moves. So why get to level 40 then? 
That's about the level I'll need to be to fight the Sylph Co. rival. After I take him down, I can get a Lapras from a Sylph employee. Lapras has a base special attack of 85, which is better than Gyarados. As a Water Ice type, Lapras will also have Stab on both Surf and Ice Beam. Lapras is slower than Gyarados, but it has more health, and its defenses are about the same. Lapras is also a guaranteed encounter for Saffron City. On the way to Fuchsia, Chloe hit level 35 and learned Moonlight. This means it's time for her to evolve. Gloom and Vileplume both learn Petal Dance at level 44, and since it's the only other move I want on her level up learn set, there's really no reason to keep her as a Gloom. When I got to Fuchsia, I went to the Safari Zone in order to get the Asian for Surf and Strength. While I'm there, I ran into a male Nidoran. I forgot that I could run into these here. I could still have a Nidoking on my team if I want to. I name him Mr. Prez because he's the king. On Route 15, I encountered a Venonat. I caught it and named it Mothra. I proceeded back to Routes 14 and 13 to see what I could catch there. On Route 14, I had an encounter that some people might disagree with. Now, I looked into the dupes clause before I started this challenge. Every site I looked it up on said that I may pass up an encounter if I've already caught it. I know that some people, when they use this rule, disallow the capture of any duplicates, but I never came across anything that said that I couldn't catch a duplicate if I chose to. I found an Oddish on Route 14 that I caught and named Cynthia, just in case Chloe were to die. With my Route 14 encounter done, I moved on to Route 13 where I found a Ditto that I named Same. Get it? <laughs> Do you get the joke? I'm hilarious, aren't I? I encountered Dodoo on Route 18 that I named Sir Birdris. I'm so unbelievably clever. This is why you came, right? Anyway, moving on. On Cycling Road, I chose not to catch anything since there isn't anything there that I want that I don't already have. While level grinding against the trainers at the north end of Cycling Road, Goro evolved into Machamp and Zatara evolved into Alakazam. If you recall from the rules at the beginning of the video, this was enabled by level up when I ran the ROM through the randomizer. With those evolutions, the entire team is fully evolved, but I'm still not going into Sylphco until the entire team is at level 40. I don't want to risk any of my Pokemon dying as I go through. Once I got my team up to level 40, I decided to take down Erica before going into Sylphco. This allows me to give Giga Drain to Chloe to replace Absorb. This is a much needed upgrade, but I'm concerned about losing Chloe after using it as TMs are single use in this game. After battling all the trainers in her gym, it's time to fight Erica. Due to the level of my Pokemon, however, she was an easy one-shot sweep with Kilgara's Flamethrower. Now it's time to go into Sylphco. I defeated all the trainers there in order to gain more experience for my team. None of them posed much of a problem, so it's onto the Sylphco rival fight. Gary opened up with his Pidgeot as always, and I led with MDB. Pidgeot went for Quick Attack because it just couldn't wait to get paralyzed, I guess. One Thunderbolt took it out, though. Growlithe came out next, and MDB showed it what he thought about his Intimidate ability by one-shotting it with Thunderbolt. Up next is Gary's Execute. MDB paralyzed it for safety before switching places with Kilgara. Execute missed MDB with Poison Powder during the Paralysis, and it missed Stun Spore that it threw at Kilgara during the switch. One flamethrower from Kilgara annihilated the Execute. Blastoise is up next, and I switched to Chloe expecting a water attack. Chloe put Gary's starter to sleep after getting hit by a critical bite for laughably small damage. Chloe used Giga Drain and took out half of Blastoise's health. Annoyingly, Blastoise woke up as soon as possible in order to bite Chloe again. One more Giga Drain finished it off, though. After taking down Blastoise, Chloe leveled up and replaced Acid with Petal Dance. I need to be careful about when I use it, though. When it gets used, I can't switch Pokemon until it's over, so if I use it at the wrong time, my opponent can send out something in order to gain type advantage while she's locked into the dance. Last up is Alakazam, and I didn't want to keep Chloe in, considering how Psychic is one of her weaknesses. I'm not sure who to send in, though. I decided to send in Sodarag since I'm planning on replacing her soon anyway so if she died, it wouldn't be a big issue. Gary's Alakazam used Calm Mind during the switch. Sodoreg intimidated her opponent so badly, he needed to use Calm Mind again in order to regain his composure. 
It didn't matter, though, because Sotoregus faster and two strengths finished it off, winning me the battle without any deaths. I picked up my Lapras as a reward and immediately headed back to the Pokemon Center in order to swap Sotoreg out for it. I named my Lapras Water Taxi because I find it entertaining. After buying a Thunderbolt TM from the game corner, I took Water Taxi north of Cerulean to grind him up to the rest of the team's level against Oddish and Abras in order to boost his special attack. At level 31, he learns Ice Beam, and I have my final move set for him. The final move set is Surf, Ice Beam, Thunderbolt, and Perish Song. Parish Song is going to be a great way to take out the final Pokemon my opponents have without having to risk any of my team. During the grind, I noticed that my special attack was significantly higher than my attack. For those of you who don't know, Lapras's base attack and special attack are both 85. This prompted me to check his nature. It was modest, which is perfect, as it raises special attack and lowers physical attack. I don't usually check natures, but I was extremely happy about this one. Now that Water Taxi is up to snuff with the rest of the team, I return to Silphco in order to battle Giovanni. He led with his Nidorino, who Kilgara immediately incinerated with a flamethrower. Up next is Rhyhorn, and I made a mistake that could have cost me a Pokemon. I opted to use Brick Break instead of switching Pokemon. Charizard, as a Fire Flying type, has a double weakness to rock moves. I didn't even consider that. Kilgara hit Rhyhorn for about half its health, and thankfully, Giovanni's Rhyhorn missed its Rock Blast. One more Brick Break finished off the Rhyhorn. Kangaskhan is up next, and I went for Flamethrower since my Charizard has a Timid Nature, which raises speed but lowers attack. It took about four-fifths of Kangaskhan's health, and Giovanni wasted his one turn using Tail Whip. Kilgara finished it off with a Brick Break. Last up is Nidoqueen and I'm not chancing this thing having a rock move. I swapped out for Water Taxi. His entrance to the battlefield was met with a Tail Whip. With Water Taxi's defense dropped, Giovanni called for Double Kick. He apparently didn't realize how weak that move is. After losing a third of his health to the kicks, Lapras hit a critical Ice Beam to finish the battle. I grabbed the Master Ball from Silphco President, and Kilgara flew me back to Fuchsia in order to battle Koga. Before taking on the gym, I headed south to Route 19 and fished with a Super Rod. If I were to lose Water Taxi, the only other water type I have is Soda Rag, so I need a better backup. I fished up a horsey, which I named Mystery. I wonder how many of you will get that reference. Time to take on Koga's gym. I swept his junior trainers aside and began the leader battle. Koga led with one of his coughings, and I lead with Zatara. I went for Future Sight. And I nearly had a heart attack when coughing used self-destruct. Zatara went from 118 health down to 24. Muck and his second coughing both went down to one psychic apiece. Just to add insult to the injury of the self-destruct, when Weezing came out, the future site I set up missed. One psychic was enough to one-shot Koga's final Pokemon, though. In hindsight, I shouldn't have even bothered with the future site. Oh well, lesson learned, moving on. Before I set my sights on another gym, I headed to the power plant to get another encounter. I found a Magnemite that I named Eisenhardt. Eisenhardt is Magneto's last name. I'm happy that I got a Magnemite instead of an Electabuzz. Electabuzz might be better than Magneton, but I like Magneton a lot more. Before I take on Sabrina, I grabbed Sir Burdress and Sodorag out of the box in exchange for Goro and Chloe. Sir Berdris and Sodoreg are both very strong physical attackers, and I have a feeling that I'm going to need them for her gym. I took Sir Berdris to Mount Moon in order to train its attack stat. After that, I went to Route 1 in order to train its speed. I don't want to take any chances that Sabrina is going to kill any of my Pokemon. I really wish I could get the Macho Brace before the final gym. For anyone who doesn't know, if you use the item finder where Giovanni was standing in the gym, you'll get the Macho Brace. After Sir Burgess was done with the EV training, I went to the north end of Cycling Road in order to train up my team to level 50, with the exception of Sodoreg, who I just gave the XP share to and called it good when the others got up to 50. Time to battle Sabrina. I immediately realized that I misremembered how strong her team was. I thought it was around level 50, but I forgot that that was her level in Pokemon Yellow. 
I'm a much higher level than I need to be, but I guess that ensures I won't be losing any Pokemon. And that's exactly the case. Sir Burdress just outsped everything, and it was a one-shot sweep with Tri Attack. I'm glad I spent so much unnecessary time grinding my team up. Although, to be fair, my terrible memory did prevent the loss of any of my team members, so I guess I'll just head over to Cinnabar Island. I did some more fishing with Super Rod on Route 20. The only thing I'm fishing up, though, are horsies. I don't think Seedra will be very good, so I opted for a surfing encounter instead. In Fire Red, you're almost guaranteed to find a Tentacool when surfing. If something should happen to Water Taxi, a Tentacruel could be a decent replacement. I found a Tentacool and called it Cthulhu. Unfortunately, he's only level 7, so grinding him up if I need to will take a lot of time. I entered the Seafoam Islands in order to get another encounter. I used Repels until I reached the bottom level. If I remember correctly from my numerous casual runs, the bottom level has the highest chance of encountering a seal. Dugong would be a fantastic replacement for Water Taxi if he were to die. I would also get to use my favorite Gen 1 Ice type. I'm leaving that as a backup plan though since Lapras is objectively better than Dugong. I found the seal I was looking for and I named him Aurora. I flew to Pallet Town after escape roping out of the Seafoam Islands. I headed south and got my encounter for Route 21. I encountered a Tangela, but I accidentally killed it, thinking that it would survive a Giga Drain. In hindsight, the severe level gap should have told me otherwise. When I arrived at Cinnabar, I revived the Aerodactyl, and that's my encounter for the town. I named it Aeroi. If you don't know what that's referencing, you should play some Gen 2. The mansion counts as its own area, however, so I have an encounter there as well. I found a coughing, which I named Choking, because it'd be hilarious if Weezing got an evolution with that name. Time to take on the gym. Blaine has a Growlithe, a Ponyta, a Rapidash, and an Arcanine. Only the Growlithe is slower than Water Taxi, but it doesn't really matter. I have leftovers equipped to him so he can heal back some of the damage he takes, and the battle is an easy one-shot sweep with Surf. With Blaine defeated, Bill invited me to go to the Sevi Islands with him. I did so and completed the side quest presented. I opted not to catch any Pokemon here, using Repels instead. If I need anything from here, I can just come back later. I made my way back to one island so I could train my team up to level 60 outside of Ember Spa. I don't need to be that strong for Giovanni, but I want to move straight from Giovanni to Victory Road. With the training done, I went to Viridian to battle Giovanni one last time. He led with one of his Rhyhorns, but I led with Water Taxi. There isn't really anything to say about this battle. It's a one-shot sweep using Surf. The only damage Water Taxi even took came from Dugtrio's Earthquake, which only hit for about 25 damage. After Giovanni went down, I grabbed the Macho Brace just because I wanted it so badly earlier. Why can't I get this thing when it would be more useful? This is practically the end of the game. Whatever. On to the next battle with Gary. On Route 22, I run into Gary again, but this time, it was required. Time to see if my team can handle him. As always, he leads with Pidgeot, and I lead with MDB. Pidgeot went for Quick Attack, because apparently it didn't learn from its last encounter at Silphco, and he got a crit. MDB doesn't care, though, and fired back with a critical of his own, but since he used Thunderbolt, he eviscerated Pidgeot's HP. Gary sends out his Rhyhorn next. I debated for a while as to what my best switch would be. Expecting a ground move, I swapped to Water Taxi for his high defense. Rhyhorn used Takedown for 22 damage, which Leftovers heals most of. Good job there, buddy. You're really doing Gary proud. One Surf easily took it out. The next Pokemon Gary sent out was his Execute. One Ice Beam was more than enough to deal with it. For some reason, Gary thought his Growlithe was a great counter for Water Taxi. I, I don't know. One Surf washed it away. Alakazam is up next, and I wasn't sure what my best move here was. I opted to stay in with Water Taxi. Lapras fired off an Ice Beam after Alakazam went for Calm Mind. Without that special defense boost, Alakazam would have gone down. The Ice Beam freezes, though. I chose to finish it off with Surf. Annoyingly, Alakazam immediately defrosted and failed to disable. For how rare it is to actually freeze your opponent, 
Why doesn't it guarantee at least one turn of immobilization? Sleep does, and it's easier to apply. I realize that freezing was overpowered in Gen 1, but come on. It worked out the same way, I guess. Last up is Blastoise. Water Taxi fired off a couple Thunderbolts to finish it off. When I chose Lapras, I didn't realize it would be such an effective counter to Gary's team. It can deal super effective damage to everything except for the Alakazam, and that's pretty incredible. I didn't battle any trainers in Victory Road so that I could take on the Elite Four without leveling up more. While I was in there, I grabbed the TM for Dragon Claw and taught it to Gilgara. I also picked up the Rare Candy for later. Before I begin the Elite Four, let's take a look at the team. Kilgara is level 62, holding the Charcoal. His moves are Flamethrower, Dragon Claw, Steel Wing, and Fly. MDB is at level 60, with the moveset of Thunderbolt, Brick Break, Thunder Wave, and Double Team. Chloe is at level 60, holding the Miracle Seed. Her moves are Giga Drain, Petal Dance, Sleep Powder, and Moonlight. Water Taxi is at level 61, holding Leftovers. His moves are Surf, Ice Beam, Thunderbolt, and Parish Song. Goro's at level 60, with the leftovers equipped. His moves are Brick Break, Cross Chop, Earthquake, and Rock Slide. Finally, we have Zatara, who has the moveset of Psychic, Future Sight, Reflect, and Recover. Without further ado, let's do this. Let's see if I can make it through this run without losing a single Pokemon. Lorelei is up first. This battle was annoying, but it wasn't hard. She led with Dugong, and I led with MDB. MDB easily took out Dugong with one Thunderbolt. Cloyster came out next, but it suffered the same fate as Dugong. Lorelei sent out Slowbro, who became MDB's third consecutive one-shot with Thunderbolt. Out next is Lapras, who tanked the Thunderbolt and fired off a Confuse Ray. Lapras ate its Citrus Berry, but it didn't make any difference. I respected the confusion and swapped out to Water Taxi. My Lapras took an Ice Beam upon entering, but Leftovers healed all the damage that it dealt. Lorelei's Lapras was faster than mine and hit a Body Slam for 30 damage before Water Taxi hit a Critical Thunderbolt. Jinx is the final Pokemon, and this is where it got annoying. I opted to go for Parish Song, knowing that I could outlast anything Jinx could throw at me, but Water Taxi got hit by a Lovely Kiss, which put him to sleep. I swapped out to kill Gara to go for the Flamethrower one-shot, but he got hit with a Tract. I'm not dealing with that so I switched back to Water Taxi. Jinx failed its Lovely Kiss since Water Taxi was already asleep, and Kilgara came back out just to get hit with another Attract. Do you see what I mean when I say that this is annoying? Water Taxi came back out and got hit by an Ice Punch just to have the damage completely healed by Leftovers. At this point, I was fed up with the nuisance and tried for Surf with Water Taxi, but Jinx used Attract and Water Taxi didn't wake up. It's back to kill Gara, and thankfully the Ice Punch didn't freeze. My Charizard proceeded to atomize the pesty Jinx with a Flamethrower. Finally! That Jinx wasn't much of a threat, but good lord was it a nuisance. I woke up my Lapras and healed kill Gara before proceeding to battle Bruno. Bruno sent out his first Onyx, and I chose the ever-reliable Water Taxi. Onyx went for an Earthquake, dealing a pathetic 30 damage before getting washed away by Surf. Hitmonchan came out next, and I thought for a while as to who I should switch into. Expecting a fighting move, I brought in Chloe to resist it. She took a Sky Uppercut upon entering and took another one before putting Hitmonchan to sleep. I took the opportunity to bring out Zatara, and since Chloe was outsped by Hitmonchan, this swap was completely safe. Now, Bruno was in trouble. One Psychic easily dealt with Hitmonchan. Hitmon Lee was sent out just to get taken out by a single Psychic. He should have just stayed in his ball. Onyx was Bruno's next choice. I thought for a while as to whether I should set up a Reflect or just go for the Psychic. I chose to go for Psychic since Onyx has terrible attack and special defense. I made the right call as Onyx fell after one hit. Last up is Machamp, who was also taken out by one Psychic. I probably should have led with the Satara, but I knew Onyx was out first and I wanted the super effective damage. I healed up Chloe and moved on to Agatha. Agatha is up next. She claims to be Ghost Trainer, but she has a Golbat and an Arbok. All of her Pokemon are Poison Pokemon, so in reality, she's a Poison Trainer. The best choice against a Poison Trainer is Zatara, so I led with him. 
And when you have an Alakazam on your team, there isn't much a Poison Trainer can do against you. It's an easy one-shot sweep with Psychic. So far, Agatha has been the easiest Leave 4 member to fight. After sweeping her off to the side, I use an Aether to restore power points for Psychic. It's time for Lance. This is the last Elite Four member before battling Gary for the last time. Let's see how it goes. I'm fairly certain that Lance leads with his Gyarados, so I put MDB at the front of my party. I was right, and MDB sent a Thunderbolt crashing down, taking it out without a fight. Lance's first Dragonair came out, and I hit it with a Thunder Wave for safety. Dragonair put up a safeguard, but it was already paralyzed, so the only thing it accomplished was to waste a turn. Water Taxi came out and ate a Dragon Rage. One Ice Beam took out the Dragonair. Aerodactyl entered the battlefield and took out almost half of Water Taxi's health with an Ancient Power before getting drowned by the Surf. Lance's second Dragonair came out. It hit Water Taxi with a weak Outrage before going down to Ice Beam. Dragonite came out last and his Safeguard wore off. Lance wasted his one turn setting up another one before going down to a Quad Effective Ice Beam. What a dumb decision on his part. I healed up Water Taxi, and it's time for the final battle. The battle started off the same as usual. Gary led with Pidgeot, and I led with MDB. One Thunderbolt took Gary's lead out without any trouble. Up next is Rhydon. I switched out to kill Gary, predicting the Earthquake, and then swapped to Goro, expecting a resisted rock attack. I realized then, though, that I forgot to teach him Earthquake. That's not good. I'm pretty sure that Stab makes Brick Brick better than Earthquake, but Rhydon isn't the Pokemon I wanted it for. I called for Brick Break and Rhydon uses Earthquake. Brick Break took out two-thirds of Rhydon's health, but Earthquake dealt a third of Goro's. I've heard that critical hits deal one and a half times damage, but I've also heard that they deal double damage. To play it safe, I assume that they deal double. I already know that Rhydon is faster due to the Rock Tomb used against Goro, so if it gets a crit with an Earthquake, Goro is dead. I choose to switch to Water Taxi to take the Earthquake and drown Rhydon. I should have done this to start, but I wanted to use Goro because he hadn't seen any action yet. Gary sent out Exeggutor and I called for an Ice Beam. He's faster than Water Taxi though, and he put Lapras to sleep. I'm relatively certain that Solar Beam is Executor's only grass move, so I stayed in hoping to get the one turn sleep and hit an Ice Beam. I was wrong though, and Lapras gets hit with a Giga Drain. I swapped out to kill Gera, expecting another Giga Drain, and he proceeded to roast his opponent, taking it out in one hit. Blastoise came out next, and I consider who to swap out to. I can't use Chloe because I'm pretty sure Blastoise knows Blizzard. I didn't think MDB could take a hit, but my other counter was asleep. I decided that if I wanted to win, I'd have to sacrifice Water Taxi. Blastoise used Rain Dance on his first turn. I started calling for Thunderbolts in case Water Taxi woke up. Hydro Pump hit, bringing Lapras down to 57 health, but he didn't wake up. Leftovers brought him back up to 72. For some reason, Gary called for Bite instead of using another Rain Boosted Hydro Pump. Bite took Water Taxi down to 46 health before Leftovers brought him back up to 61. He was still sleeping, though. The next Hydro Pump missed Lapras, and he woke up and took out two-thirds of Blastoise's health with a Thunderbolt. Blastoise ate his berry, and Leftovers healed Water Taxi up to 76 health. Lapras survived another rain-boosted Hydro Pump with only 18 health, and took out his opponent with one last Thunderbolt. That was amazing. I fully expected to lose Water Taxi there, but he managed to not only survive, but knock out Gary's strongest Pokemon. Alakazam came out next. I looked at my team, but I didn't see a good choice to switch in. I took a look at Zatara, but I didn't think he had enough special defense to take a hit, even though it would be resisted. I could be wrong though, maybe that would have been fine. I remember, though, that Gary usually uses Future Sight on his first turn, so I chose to go for the Hail Mary Freeze with Ice Beam. Instead, Ice Beam crits, taking out Alakazam with one hit. I couldn't believe it. Outlast is Arcanine. I knew that I didn't have a safe switch, so I called for Parish Song, knowing that if I managed to hit it, I'd win regardless of how well Arcanine did. Unfortunately, Flamethrower was enough to finish off Water Taxi. 
Lapras was probably the MVP of this run, but this was Gary's last Pokemon and I still had my whole team alive. I decided to start playing a bit more aggressively and sacrifice Pokemon in order to gain the advantage in the fight. I sent out MDB to hit the Thunder Wave. Flamethrower took out a third of his health, but then the Future Sight hit, bringing him down to 50 health. I called for Thunderbolt to get whatever damage I could in before MDB goes down, but unfortunately, he landed a crit that brings Arcanine into full restore range. That essentially nullified everything that MDB did against Gary's last Pokemon. After MDB went down, I sent out Goro. This is why I wanted Earthquake. I called for Rock Slide since it's the only super effective attack I have to use. It took out two-thirds of Arcanine's health while it was immobilized from the full restore. Goro tanked the flamethrower before finishing the battle with another Rock Slide. And that's it. I beat my first ever Nuzlocke having only lost two Pokemon. This run was easier than expected. Maybe it's because of how familiar I am with the game, or maybe my rules weren't strict enough. I definitely regret having overleveled so much in the early game to the point of where I didn't do so in the late game. I had fun doing this though. I'm thinking of doing another Nuzlocke. I'm either going to do it in Emerald, or I'm going to do a randomizer Nuzlocke of Fire Red. I'm not sure yet. We'll see how it goes. That's it for this video though. Thank you so much for watching and have a good day.